The Doors, Setting the Record Straight, is brought to you by Delco Electronics, producer of the new Odyssey Sound System. The movie will begin in five moments, the mindless voice announced. All those unseated will await the next show. We filed slowly, languidly into the hall. The auditorium was vast and silent. As we seated and were darkened, the voice continued. The program for this evening is not new. You have seen this entertainment through and through. You've seen your birth, your life and death. You might recall all of the rest. Did you have a good world when you died? Enough to base a movie on? How you doing, everybody? I'm Jim Ladd with the second episode of The Doors, Setting the Record Straight, a Westwood One presentation created and produced by Sandy Gibson. In this hour, we'll be looking at the movie The Doors, what's verifiable and what's questionable. Jim Morrison and Ray Manzarek met at UCLA Film School in 1965, and they shared a mutual respect and fascination for film. When questioned in 1970 on the nature of film, Experimental filmmaker Morrison had this to say. But it's all done tongue-in-cheek. I, I don't think people ever realize that. But it's, uh, it's not really serious, you know. Uh -huh. It's just, like, if you play a villain in a Western, that doesn't mean that that's you. you know? I mean, that's just an aspect that you choose to show you. Jim Morrison also experimented with the principles of the living theater, Julian Beck's avant-garde theatrical troupe, who taunted their audiences into actively participating, thus creating a total performance. I just lament the fact that uh, so many people are uh, content with uh, living a very quiet, well-mannered, orderly life when so many um, obvious injustices, I guess, are, are going on and they, and they just uh, seem to ignore it somehow. Or, or not or not care at all just let it happen without ever becoming involved I think that's sad wake up you're all a bunch of snakes The voice you just heard sounds like Jim Morrison's, and what you're listening to now might well convince you that it was recorded in 1969. It wasn't, though. In reality, it's the actor Val Kilmer in the most elaborate, most expensive, and most controversial tribute yet. The movie The Doors, released March 1st, 1991, on the 22nd anniversary of the actual Miami concert, was estimated to have cost in the neighborhood of $80 million. Here now is an actual recording of the events as they unfolded in Miami. You know, I was born here in this state. You know that? Yeah, I was born right here in Melbourne, Florida in 1943. I think they call it Cape something now. I don't know. Yeah, and then I, I left for a little while, and I came back, and I went to uh, a little uh, junior college in St. Petersburg. You know where that is? Then I left there, and I went up to a little uh, college in Tallahassee called FSU. Then I got smart. Then I went out to a beautiful state called California. Went out to a little city named Los Angeles. Now listen, I'm not talking about no revolution. I'm not talking about no demonstration. I'm talking about having fun. I'm talking about dancing. I want to see you people get up and dance. I want to see you people dancing in the street this summer. I want to see you have some fun. I want to see you roll around. I want to see you paint the town. I want to see you ring it out. I want to 
see you shout. I want to see some fun. I want to see some fun from everyone. There are no rules. There are no laws. Do whatever you want to do. Do it. All right. All right. Now I want to see some action out there. I want to see some action out there. Come on, let's get on up here. No limits, no laws. Come on, come on. The movie played havoc with facts, and there's no doubt that the most powerful portions of this film are musical. The Doors' original recordings were digitally transferred, creating extra tracks. This enabled Val Kilmer to sing along with Morrison's original voice track. In essence, this very elaborate case of overdubbing allowed Val to be singing during close-up photography instead of lip-syncing. From the Doors movie soundtrack, the voice of the real Jim Morrison. Riders on the storm. Riders on the storm. Into this house we're born. Into this world we're thrown. Like a dog without a bone and actor out alone. Riders on the storm. There's a killer on the road His brain is squirming like a toad Take a long holiday Let your children play If you give this man a ride Sweet family will die Killer on the road Yeah
Riders on the storm Riders on the storm Into this house we're born Into this world we're thrown Like a dog without a bone And actor out alone Riders on the storm The Doors was directed and co-written by Oliver Stone, a two-time Academy Award winner for his direction of Platoon and Born on the Fourth of July. In fact, you might almost say that with these pictures, Oliver Stone has created a trilogy about the 60s. We asked Stone what message he was trying to get across. I hope that they remember that there was a time, a little bit of time, and a little sun shined in, and uh, the kids questioned everything. They were re rebelling. They question their parents and they question authority, legal authority and military authority. And uh, there was a little camelot of time when alternate ways of thinking of behaving were allowed and were examined by people like Jim. An emphasis on the Doors as representatives of a turbulent decade is at the heart of the film, The Doors. What elements may have contributed to the film's failure when we return? The time to hesitate is through. No time to wallow in the mire Try now we can only lose And our love become a funeral pyre Come on baby, light my fire Come on baby, light my fire Try to set the night on fire in the 20 years since Jim Morrison's death, a movie about the Doors was one of those projects that was always being talked about in Hollywood as being in development. In 1981, writing the success of Saturday Night Fever, John Travolta was among the actors jockeying to portray Jim Morrison, and Brian De Palma, director of Carrie and Bonfire of the Vanities, was among the filmmakers eager to tackle the Doors saga. But it wasn't until 91, a full 10 years later, that it became a go project. And it required the diplomacy and negotiating skills of rock impresario Bill Graham as executive producer to make it happen. In theory, Oliver Stone appeared an excellent choice to put the doors on the screen. Stone has a lock on their historical period with both Platoon and Born on the Fourth of July. In fact, Stone enlisted to serve in the conflict overseas. And it was there, in the big muddy of Vietnam, that he first heard a Doors record broadcast on Armed Forces Radio. Break on through, first album, Light My Fire, 67 Vietnam Infantry, Camp Evans, First Corps. And I said, this is better than getting stoned, there's something here. You know the day destroys the night, night divides the day. Try to run, try to hide, break on through to the other side. Break on through to the other side, break on through to the other side, yeah. Chased our pleasures here, dug our treasures there. But can't you still recall the time we cried? Break on through to the other side. Break on through to the other side.
we've been here in Country Western, and we've been here in Motown. Those were the two most popular. Mm -hmm. And then this head rock came, Jefferson Airplane, uh, the Sgt. Pepper, and uh, then the door. And from that time on, it seems, Oliver Stone was fascinated with Jim Morrison. Apparently a fascination of such enormous proportions that Stone felt a special kinship with Morrison, and quite oddly, referred to him as Jimmy in conversation and in print. From the sound of it, Stone's fascination bordered on an identification with the lead singer of The Doors. I've been on a search too, pretty, pretty interesting odyssey of my own, through different lifestyles and different places and times. I'm glad I got to live a little longer than Jim, but he packed it into 27 years, and he, you know, he, he had, he, I think he said pretty much what he wanted to say. I think his second act, he wanted to be a filmmaker. I'm not that crazy about being an actor. I'd, I'd rather be a director or a writer, something like that. But uh, if I had a chance, I'd probably do a few films. Why not? Uh, Shakespeare was an actor when he first came to London. Still, Stone may have projected himself too strongly onto his depiction of Jim Morrison. Consider this scene from the beginning of the movie. Val Kilmer is the young Morrison who has just shown a student film he's made to a classroom full of fellow students. And Oliver Stone himself plays the professor. All right, hold it down, hold it. Let's ask the filmmaker what he thinks. You're gonna be down. Shut up. Mr. Morrison. I quit. Although poorly recorded over 23 years ago, this archival interview with Jim Morrison documents his academic accomplishments. I traveled around a lot as a child, and I went to so many schools about one school, different school a year, or every year and a half, I'd go to a different one. I finished up at UCLA. The only reason I did it was because I didn't want to go in the Army, and I didn't want to work, and school was fairly easy for me, so I just kept doing it. And that's the damn truth. The main key to education is just reading, basically. You could do the same thing in your own. Although the cinematic version is certainly dramatic, it wasn't factual, at least in Morrison's case. We've established that Jim didn't walk away from his college career. He graduated from UCLA's theater arts department with a BA in fine arts in 1965. Whether this is a simple issue of creative license or a complex case of superimposing one's own painful experiences onto another, it was Oliver Stone who quit school dropping out of Yale his freshman year after only a few months of matriculation to enlist in the armed services. Wait until the war is over And we're both a little older Unknown soldier Breakfast where the news is real
Watching the movie The Doors, it's easy to ask how Jim Morrison ever managed to write a song, let alone record or perform one. The Morrison character in the film drinks and uses drugs incessantly to the exclusion of all other activities. There's no doubt that Morrison imbibed, but not 100% of the time, to the exclusion of sobriety. Yet in Director Stone's view... I thought he was a real anti-hero, sort of a Marlon Brando, Jimmy Dean type in the late 60s. I, I thought he was cool. Uh, his attitude was cool about everything. and He was out there uh, for me, you know, was always doing more excessive things, trying to find another way. But again, Stone blurred the boundaries between the genres of documentary fact and creative license. We cannot prove that Stone consciously set out to defame Morrison, as in his celluloid interpretation of the relationship between Jim Morrison and Pamela Curzon. According to The Doors and Pamela's parents, we have established that the scene where Jim locks Pamela in a closet and set it on fire is a figment of Stone's fertile imagination. But, unfortunately, an ill-informed columnist for Newsweek, none other than George Will himself, took the bait and swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. In a quite unprofessional manner, repeated Stone's fantasies as fact in his Newsweek column. And I quote, Jim Morrison died at 27 and not a day too soon, end of quote. Like any couple, Jim and Pamela's relationship had its stormy moments, but it had its tender aspects too, epitomized in this song. Well, she's fashionably lean And she's fashionably lay She'll never break a scene She'll never break a day but she's no drag, just watch the way she walks She's a 20th century fox She's a 20th century fox No tears, no fears, no ruin years, no clock She's the lady who waits Since her mind left school It never hesitates She won't waste time on elementary talk Cause she's a 20th century fox She's a 20th century fox Got the world locked up inside a plastic box. She left ready.
We'll have more on The Doors, the movie, right after this. You have to have some sympathy for the task that director Oliver Stone undertook when he agreed to make the movie The Doors. As he himself put it, I think it's already been publicized, there's been a few battles, you know, but uh, we had to be approved by five different parties to do this film, all of whom had different points of view, so it was never easy. You should always make a film about somebody who's been dead for more than 30 years because <laughs> you hope that everybody else dies with it. In Stone's case, obviously, he wanted the validation of the surviving members of The Doors, Ray Manzarek, Robbie Krieger, and John Densmore. They, at least, could verify or refuse to endorse the way he portrayed them. But when it came to Jim Morrison and Pamela Curzon, Stone had to rely solely on other people's memories. And so did the actors who played them. Both Meg Ryan and Val Kilmer, already in their early 30s, had to portray characters who are not yet 20. According to Stone, Val pulled a fast one. Val wanted to do it. I only worried that he might have been too old. He told me he was 27, you know. Now I hear he's 31. <laughs> so he really conned me. We asked Kilmer what he thought of Morrison. He was a tremendously talented artist, and I don't use the word lightly, but he was a genius. Kilmer had a plethora of material to help him recreate Morrison cinematically. But Meg Ryan says that the difficulty she faced playing Pamela Corson was that... Really, I had to do a lot of uh, mediating between the very conflicting, a lot of conflicting information that I was getting. There was not a lot of it, and I had to talk uh, to people who knew her only in terms of, of Jim. I talked to her parents a little bit. People would say absolutely contradictory things about her. She was a heroin addict. She wasn't a heroin addict. She, she was so afraid of needles she could never have been. Uh, she was awful and mean and a bitch. No, she was a wonderful, sweet child. She was a monster. I mean, back and, back and forth. Everybody told me she was so horrible and a nightmare chick and blah, blah, blah. But she, he loved her. That was the, you can't overlook that fact that he would always come back to that one woman and she would stick with him. Still, in spite of the film's best efforts and the actor's intensity in attempting to portray the relationship between Jim and Pamela, it lacked color. It seems thin. And that may simply be because no one behind the cameras really had enough to go on. The Doors music still says more about the relationship between Jim and Pam than any film about them is ever likely to. But it's true 
We'll be back with The Doors, setting the record straight, right after this. Awake. Shake dreams from your hair, my pretty child, my sweet one. Choose the day and choose the sign of your day, the day's divinity. First thing you see. A vast, radiant beach and a cool, jeweled moon. Couples naked race down by its quiet side. And we laugh like soft, mad children, smug in the woolly cotton brains of infancy. Music and voices are all around us. Choose, they croon, the ancient ones. The time has come again. Choose now, they croon, beneath the moon, beside an ancient lake. Enter again the sweet forest, enter the hot dream, come with us. Everything is broken up and dances. The movie The Doors lasts two hours and 15 minutes. By the time it's over, you're not in much doubt as to how Stone views Jim Morrison. Stone puts it this way. Jim was enamored of mystery and uh, darkness and also of death. Uh, he was a bit of a shaman, uh, listening for outer spiritual forces and inner forces. He would try to bring that into his songs and into his lyrics and he would, at the concerts, he would share it with a tribe and the tribe would, would, would be healed by the vision. Uh, there was an ancient ceremony to, to Jim. Indians scattered on dawn's highway bleeding, ghosts crowd the young child's fragile eggshell mind. I love uh, Jim's hunger for the unknown. He was an explorer. It was like going out there to the edge and out here on the perimeter we is stoned immaculate of that line. Uh, I, I suppose, you know, he's the, uh, he's Theseus in the Greek story. I tell you this, no eternal reward will forgive us now for wasting the dawn. Back in those days, everything was simpler and more confused. One summer night, going to the pier, I ran into two young girls. The blonde was called Freedom, the dark one, Enterprise. We talked, and they told me the story. Now listen to this. I'll tell you about Texas you about Radio and the Big Beat. Soft, driven, slow and mad like some new language.
reaching your head with the cold, sudden fury of a divine messenger. Let me tell you about heartache and the loss of God, wandering, wandering in hopeless night. Out here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Morrison's interest ranged from the symbol-laden poetry of Rimbaud to the books of Nietzsche and Carlos Castaneda. When he was in UCLA, Jim studied the films of legendary Danish director Carl Dreyer, especially the one about the martyred saint, Joan of Arc. During his formative years, Jim was influenced by the early European filmmakers and dramatists. He appreciated their sense of irony. In fact, you can hear the play-acting side of Morrison on The Doors' first album, when they recorded a song written in the 1920s by legendary German playwright Bertolt Brecht, with music by the equally legendary German composer Kurt Weill. Well, show me the way to the next whiskey bar. Oh, don't ask why. Oh, don't ask why. Show me. I tell you we must die I tell you, I tell you, I tell you we must die Oh moon, I Now must say goodbye the Jim Morrison you don't find in Oliver Stone's movie. The one who turned audiences on because he had different facets. Witty as well as sinister. Flirtatious as well as menacing. Yet the movie The Doors has its redeeming features. We'll talk about the most important when the hour concludes.
set me free. Whatever you thought of the movie The Doors, it seems safe to say that it has introduced many new listeners to their music. Frank Whaley, who portrayed Robbie Krieger in the film, talks about recreating the band in concert. People were screaming and, you know, and, and running on the stage. And, you know, and I think they thought we were, you know, they thought I was actually playing, which is, you know, that, you know, that didn't, they didn't realize, you know, a lot of them thought, sometimes, you know, kids are so naive, they thought I was actually Robbie Krieger. They, you know, they, 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 they couldn't, they, I don't know, I don't understand the reasoning. Zarek is not happy with Stone's cinematic version of the Doors saga. We asked Stone if Ray's genuine concerns bothered him. After all, it is Ray's life and Ray's story. He was helpful in the beginning. You know, he did me, he did give me a lot of insight in his talks. And then when I wrote my first draft, he he burned it and uh, he said this is the horrible violation, and that he would have nothing to do with it unless I wrote it the way he wanted it to be written. And basically, I think that he wants to make his own movie about Jim and sees him a certain way. Kyle McLaughlin recreated the role of Ray Manzarek, and he was left with this impression. That was the true, those were the highest moments that Ray has ever experienced, and that his <laughs> dilemma right now is, and has been all his life, has been trying to sort of come recapture that, I think. So I think it's a sort of a, it's a very sad, tragic element about that, you know, that he's, that, that was taken away from him, you know, it was almost his, his, you know, his food. I looked at you, you looked at me, I smiled at you, you smiled at me, and we're on our way, no one can tell my fate, yeah, we're on our way, and we can't tell my fate.
great creator of being, grant us one more hour to perform our art and perfect our lives. We live, we die, and death not ends it. After years of being intrigued with Morrison, almost haunted by his persona, how does filmmaker Stone sum up Morrison the man? Well, I think anyone uh, like that who does that kind of work of singing and writing and being an artist, I mean, he has to have his, he has to have an inner ear, you know, he's, he's got to be listening for those forces out there. And Jim caught him. He was real clear about it, too. I mean, you knew that he was in touch with something. He wasn't your ordinary rock and roll guy. He was a poet disguised as a rock and roll prince. This has been episode two of The Doors, setting the record straight. In our next episode, we'll be exploring the last days before Jim's demise and the mysterious circumstances surrounding his death. I'm Jim Ladd. The Doors, setting the record straight, is a Westwood One presentation. Brought to you by Delco Electronics, producer of the new Odyssey sound system, and by the U.S. Navy. You and the Navy, full speed ahead. Created and produced by Sandy Gibson. Written by Sandy Gibson, Craig Fisher, and John Flex Fleming. Engineering and production by Ron Harris. Production assistants Melanie Minear and Catherine Farley. Special thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Columbus Curzon for access to their archives. Additional interviews were conducted by Marsha Richardson. Executive producer, Norm Pattis. Let's reinvent the gods, all the myths of the ages. Celebrate symbols from deep elder forests.